Well, good morning. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thanks for joining me today as we are in those beautiful coronation psalms in the 90s. So today we're in Psalm 98, a beautiful psalm to share with you this morning. Thank you for joining me. Let's look at it together. To understand this psalm, though, you have to actually look in the New Testament. Some call this the Magnificat of the Old Testament. The Magnificat being generally recognized is that Song of Mary that you'll find in Luke chapter 1. seems that after she received the announcement from the angel that she would bear the Messiah, she would be the mother of the Lord Jesus, she needed somewhere to go. She needed a place to hide out and get some encouragement. And the Lord thought about that. He was way ahead of her. And it provided that her cousin Elizabeth, much older and godly woman, would be pregnant with John the Baptist, a bit ahead of her and able to encourage her not only in the areas of her own pregnancy and uh, the baby to come, but also to bless and encourage her in the ways of the Lord because she knew firsthand of his miraculous work in her own life. So Mary comes to visit Elizabeth at Elizabeth's house and immediately when she enters and Elizabeth uh, says, hey, the baby in my womb leaped for joy when he heard your voice, and Mary responds, responds with a passage known as the Magnificent, a beautiful, beautiful song known as the Song of Mary that, amazingly enough, seems to reflect this psalm. Now, for those who say that uh, it, it looks like she was meditating on Psalm 98 before she went to visit the house of Elizabeth, I say, but wait a minute, you, you've got something else to look at here. And I think it doesn't prove that she was specifically looking at this psalm on her way to the home of Elizabeth. But I think it just shows that Mary was a gal of the word. She knew the word of God. She was young. She was most likely in her teens when this took place. Yet she knew the word of God, had it memorized, and had it in her heart. You know how we know? It's not just Psalm 98 that Mary quotes in the New Testament. Mary actually quotes from Psalms 34, 71, this one 98, 103, 107, 111, 132, and 138. So what do we know about Mary? We know that the Lord chose her. Chose her not just for a womb, okay, to bear a child, but chose her because she was a godly, set-apart woman, highly favored, the word says. And she was the kind of woman that God himself would want raising his son. And that means that Mary was one who obviously knew the word of God as it was delivered to her. So understanding that, let's read Psalm 98 together. It's one of those beautiful coronation psalms that tells us how to worship in a number of ways and how to look at the Lord in a number of ways. Let's look at it together. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. And this is one of the reasons why music is so powerful in our times of worship. Everywhere in the Psalms where you see jubilant worship, music is always a part of it. Every voice possible, every instrument possible to lift praises unto the Lord. Verse 5 says, make music to the Lord with the harp with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord the King. And that last phrase is literally shout before King Yahweh. So, you know, when we're praising the Lord, I know there's times for quiet and contemplative music. But, you know, over and over again in the Psalms, we've been seeing the same thing. Make his praise glorious. Lift it high. Shout unto the Lord. And, you know, we seem to do more worship at a football game or a basketball game than we do in church, where we get really excited about our team and we will scream at the top of our lungs. Put us in church, however, and we fold our hands, slump down into our pew, and you can hardly get us to breathe a word unless we are whispering to our neighbor about something that has nothing to do with worship. 
Friends, it ought to be just the opposite. When we come together for worship, it ought to be a time where we are clapping our hands and we're praising the Lord and we're shouting to his name and celebrating his presence in our life. I think that's the power of real worship. Verse seven, let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Now, if that last verse and that last word in this psalm is is a little bit confusing to you, when you hear the word equity, sometimes you're just thinking about how much value you actually have in your house after 20 years of mortgage payments. That's not what it's talking about. It's the other part of the, uh, another meaning of the word equity. That's why the Christian Standard Bible, Good Word, God's Word Translation, some others translate that word fairness. Now, isn't this something that we are looking for today? All around, even in a nation that was put together with godly principles like our own, where we supposedly have checks and balances to make sure we have a fair judicial system. Quite often it is unfair. We'll see someone who commits a crime and when they report it on the news, they'll talk about the rap sheet that's as long as your arm and so many crimes that seem to be serious that have somehow been overlooked as that criminal is walking the streets, something for which he should have been put away with a life sentence, but somehow got off and is now committing other crimes. Then we'll run into others who have been put away for long sentences for seemingly lesser crimes, and we wonder where is the equity in that? And there's where that word equity comes in. It's not fair, is it? But you see, there is no perfect system in the world. Usually folks who get a little bit uh, disturbed about their own life or lifestyle or position decide it must be the country's fault. And we need to change the fundamental structure of our nation and try something else. And many times uh, in history, we've seen people try everything from the monarchies to democracy, to a republic, constitutional republic like we have, to socialism, to communism, totalitarianism, Nazism, all the isms, none of them work when sinful people are at the helm. It is true that uh, Benjamin Franklin, Jonathan Adams, many of our founders said our system of government is only a government for moral and godly people. And uh, if you don't have that in the mix, then not even our system will work. But, you know, one day we won't have to worry about that now, will we? Because what's coming is the ultimate fair, honest and right judge. The Bible says one of the reasons we can sing before the Lord today is he is coming to judge the earth. And because he's coming to judge, we know that finally at that point, it will be done correctly. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the peoples with fairness. I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to that day. In the meantime, we do the best we can and allow our folks to rule and reign with the best possible checks and balances to try to make sure that government is at least reasonable. That's one of the duties of good Christian citizens in this day, but don't expect it to be perfect. It won't be perfect until the perfect king of righteousness rules and reigns. Well, God bless you. You have a great day in the Lord. Join me again here tomorrow on Wake Up in the Word. And if you like what we're doing, please hit the like button and uh, subscribe so that we can keep these videos coming to you right here on YouTube. God bless you. You have a great day.